I just want to say, uh, when I saw the title of the session, Creating a Resilient and Inclusive Post-Pandemic World, I, I thought this is just the conversation that I'd like to have, that we need, we should have had. Every time there's a major blow like this, obviously that's very rare. This is what we're seeing now as a, a rare occurrence, but long predicted. And in as much as I saw that as being the conversation I want to have, once I read the bios of the fellows, uh, I realized that many of you have very deep experiences experience in public sector work and in service delivery and uh, in fact all of you and so I just wanted to launch this conversation with a hype kind of a hypothesis that if we don't have some major strides towards inclusion then our chance of resilience or resiliency uh, is much dim diminished and I think we're seeing this come out in, uh, certainly in the United States, the way the epidemic is playing out here, but I imagine in many of the settings in which you now sit, that you can also point to social inequalities and social fissures of various sorts that have led to increased risk for, for all of us, that's what the epidemic does, but to very increased risk for some groups of people. And and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna mention in passing why I feel so strongly about this. I'm an infectious disease doctor and an anthropologist, and I focus my work on epidemic disease, both responding as a clinician, like, in Ebola, like taking care of patients with Ebola in West Africa, but also in terms of my research. So, uh, and I chair a department called the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Uh, so you can imagine again that the topic creating a resilient and inclusive post-pandemic world is very much in the sweet spot of that department, but also it would might surprise people how many physicians are, are interested in creating a resilient and inclusive post-pandemic world. I have worked with thousands of other people on responding to a number of epidemics over the last three years, AIDS and tuberculosis, and also their drug-resistant forms, which constitute something of a, a new threat that we see, especially with bacteria, but also with viruses and parasites, and that is increasing res resistance to the agents that we do develop to treat them. And that, of course, leaves us with vaccines, but uh, in spite of decades of effort, there are still no vaccines for the three leading infectious killers of young adults in the world and the leading killer of children as well, and that's AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. So those three pathogens have certainly altered my life over the years because these are, as I said, the leading killers in many of the places I work. I've spent much of my career in Haiti and Rwanda and in the United States, but I've also had occasion to work in, over the years in the same settings in, in Malawi, Lesotho, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mexico, and Peru. And that means, of course, taking on very rapid moving epidemics like this one, or like cholera, and even Zika as it swept across Latin America felt like it was moving pretty quickly. And then these slower epidemics of tuberculosis and HIV, which are truly pandemics, um, and now we have COVID-19. So in addition to the hi hypothesis that uh, in increasing inclusion is, has to be part of our uh, plan, I mean, really formally a part of a plan, you know, you'd think after all these years and all these epidemics, we wouldn't go about predicting that this one is gonna be the great level, of, you know, where people, regardless of their station, are high and shared and equivalent risk. That's not true. It's hard to point to any epidemic, at least I would have a hard time pointing to any epidemic where people who were living in poverty or marginalized by exclusive exclusionary forces are pretty much always at the highest risk of um, both the pathogen infecting them, but also poor outcomes once infected. And, and then also another bankrupt metaphor is the perfect storm. Every, you know, I've owned, I, I started medical school in the early 80s and I can't tell you how many times, although the, the, the clinicians here will, will know this and public health champions, can't tell you how many times I've heard this claim that, uh, you know, that this is, this is the perfect storm. And uh, again, I think that's, we may feel that at times, but the nature of the storm and the social context where it hits is what determines um, the contours of the epidemic. And, and finally, to hand it over on a very positive or a more positive note, I want to add that the title of your workshop didn't surprise me. It delighted me, did, but didn't surprise me. We've heard more about safety nets, health insurance, social inequalities, preparedness, and more about what kind of nation and world we want to live, on, live in. I've heard more of this conversation 
in the past couple of months than than usual and i would say for me than ever before in my lifetime so i take that as a very positive optimistic note and seeing the diversity um, of engagement in this topic was just deeply heartening to me